All right, so this is being recorded and I'll share the agenda. That's why, Ooh, that's interesting. Can everyone see the agenda? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's funny, they actually, um, dang, I, I, up, I updated my Zoom, but I can't now, oh, there we are. Oh, it's a little different. I can't see you though. Yeah, and I can't, um, oh, there we are. Let me see if this helps. Sorry. I, I didn't like, I don't like updates because then it changes your whole, you know, how you view the software. <laughs> All right, I think that's good. All right, I think we're all set. Is everyone, can everyone else hear me? And yeah, yeah. The um, Ben Breger is here. He's a planner with the town. I think he's on the previous uh, meeting, and he'll slowly be taking over block grant responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And you know, it'll be a, a transition over the next so many months. But mm -hmm. he's kind of learning the ropes. It's a little difficult actually <laughs> with remote working and everything. So. Yeah, certainly. Well, I'll kind of take take the time over the next few meetings and next months, I guess, to kind of just see how the process plays out and uh, be able to learn from Nate, who's a master of all things CDBG. So. Jeez, yeah, <laughs> it's <a> great title. <laughs> <laughs> the um, and another announcement is that we interviewed a number of candidates for the vacancies on the committee. And um, the way it works is, you know, we have these 15 minute interviews with the chair of the committee, the applicant, the town manager, and then someone on the resident advisory committee. And then the town manager um, is the appointing authority. And then the town council has 30 days to review or approve the recommendations of appointment. And so there's two or three, um, I think three member, new members that'll be appointed and one is Becky Michaels, I think that's Becky's name. And um, she's on the call as an attendee. And then there's um, a gentleman named Lucas and then um, uh, someone else um, named Rika. And they may attend tonight. They, they, are, they haven't officially been um, sworn in or I'm not sure they, the town council's reviewed their appointment yet, but hopefully they'll, they'll be able to join us for the next meeting so they can, you know, be here for the remainder of the grant application cycle. And I don't have any other announcements if anyone else does. Mm -mm. All right, uh, the update on the CARES funding, you know, we, we have it. Uh, we finally have a contract with DHCD. So we have 321-577. And the, uh, all the contracts started, are starting this month. So Valley CDC has $140,000 in grants to give out to micro businesses. And uh, they have a webpage that's set up for the Amherst program. They hope to go live November 1. It'll be an information session in the next, maybe two information sessions in the next two weeks. But essentially they started putting documents online just to allow people to see what they're looking for and get prepared and then they can apply. Um, it's a first come first serve basis, but uh, we think it'll be, we've been working with a bit in the chamber and we have to do a little bit more outreach, but people are already starting to, you know, get, they can sign up to get the notifications and everything. So we're hoping that program reaches everyone that needs it. Nate, do, uh, you, know, also uh, three do you know what the maximum grant will be to small businesses? It's, uh, the, I think the range is 2,500 to 10,000. Okay. And, you know, but it's a, a micro enterprise is five or fewer employees, mm -hmm. including the owner. And that's not full time equivalence. That's just five employees. And the owner has to be income qualified based on family income. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because the owner of the business may, the business may not be doing well, but if the, you know, if the family income is okay, they may actually be ineligible. Um, income eligible. So, you know, there is some process to review to make sure the business is qualified. Uh, 
you know, there's a, and the, the state put a few other requirements. So, you know, they have to have been in business as of January 1st, 2019. They have to be in good standing with taxes and other things. And then um, they have to show a loss of income because of COVID equal to the amount they're requesting, which shouldn't be hard, but, um, you know, maybe some businesses might, depending on, you know, it might be a lot to ask of a business to have that documentation ready to apply. And so, you know, Valley's administering this for a number of communities. And so they're trying to streamline and we've, we've met a number of times to try to come up with a, hopefully as a straightforward application process or as straightforward as it can be. And then, you know, there's three social services. There's the survival center is getting money for their food pantry. Um, they have a year to spend that. So all the social services have, everything's a year at least uh, till next September. Um, you know, the survival center has seen a huge increase in their, in their demand. So that's, um, I don't think they have, they could easily justify that expenditure. Uh, we're funding a three quarter position with family outreach to, house, to help with housing stabilization and casework management. So they'd already been doing this with Amherst. Um, they go to housing court now to almost once a week. And um, they've been providing a lot of additional services for households, families, uh, mostly families, but some individuals. So they'll be continuing that and actually bringing on or increasing the hours of their caseworkers. And then uh, Craig's Doors, they operate the seasonal shelter in town and the resource center. And they're getting about 20,000 for uh, help to try to find housing for homeless individuals. So that's, you know, that's, um, I think that'll be challenging depending on, you know, the market and, but, you know, it's something that would be great to um, use that money to try to get some people out of homelessness. And so I think, you know, I thank the committee for the effort to go through this summer in a quick, quick process. I think it's been, you know, we've just started, but I think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, the organizations seem like they're ready and they can fulfill all the grant requirements. You know, for instance, like with the microenterprise program, we have to do weekly reporting. <laughs> it's just weekly? pretty terrible. Really, every Tuesday by 2 p.m., um, which, you know, they're, they're okay. It's just, it's only the last two weeks. They have a, a, a template spreadsheet and then we have to provide a brief narrative, but you know, um, so it's, it's kind of a lot to just do every week, you know, for the next three months or whatever, four months. Has Craig's Doors done any of this type of um, reporting and compliance before? I'm not sure if they've received CDBG funds before. Mm, it's been a while. So they have, um, it's been a while, but they have an office manager who I think is capable. And Kevin Noonan is an, um, the director. I think he's familiar with it. So I think, you know, we've, I, we've, they're going over the contract right now. And I think, um, I think they can, I think they can do it. You know, they only have quarterly reporting. Um, and they do get, they were getting HUD money uh, and ESG funding for other things. So I think they're familiar with reporting and kind of, you know, stricter grant requirements. Good. They, yeah, no, they have had a lot of questions about the contract, which is good. So at least I know they're reading it. And when is the money actually going to be in distributed? You know, it's a reimbursement process. So, you know, I'm, I'm assuming in a month, a month from now, we'll be getting reimbursement requests from some of the social services and, you know, Valley might bill a little bit. Um, but, you know, we set out a 12 month budget for the social services. So it'll be, you know, they might just prorate the budget and then just say, you know, roughly X amount every month for the next 12 months. So even they may be, they could spend it down as fast as they want, or they might, you know, I don't know how sometimes they like to keep it within a fiscal year. So they like to spend it by June just because, um, you know, they don't have to carry it over on their books. So I don't, I don't really know how they'll spend it down, but. You know, in the grants for small businesses, we're assuming that by the end of the year, we might have, um, we, but we, you know, we think we might have given out enough grants to, you know, to be done with that program essentially. And then we still have to do follow-up reporting for, for a while though. Are there any other questions, any questions about that or anything or? Um... Yeah. 
No, no. All right. So I will say, unfortunately, the state has not provided any information about the upcoming grant cycle. So I think it's good. I think it's good if we set a schedule and we can, you know, stick to it. We can be a little flexible. Um, you know, I'm assuming they're not going to change much uh, from last year. You know, I mean, really, it's there's been there hasn't been any um, any really discussion of that at the at the state level yet, as far as I can tell. Or if there, if there has been, it hasn't been distributed. So usually at this time, you know, we'd have received at least um, an email, and they have you know a draft action plan or something. But I don't. I'm not sure they've gotten to it. I think they've been busy with everything else. So, uh, you know, my thought is we could set a schedule for the next few months, talk about the RFP process and target areas and everything. And we could just, you know, we'll assume everything's copacetic until we hear otherwise. And, you know, I think they have the ability to, um, the state has the ability to, you know, to adjust the program if they think they need to because of COVID not you know i don't i'm not sure they will but you know it could be that you know that the state might say oh well we're actually we need to do a second round of emergency funding or something you know i you know for instance and then maybe our our process changes a little bit but i haven't heard about that um yet so i wish i had more information i, I feel like you know i don't think we'll have to repeat anything it's just it's hard to, to i think to structure something when we don't have any guidelines but but it's still it's still happening as far as you know. Yeah, so this is Amherst's third year. Um, you know, we have a we're a mini for three years. This is the third year. This upcoming grant is our third year as a mini entitlement. And then the state said that they would, you know, um, review the whole mini program every three years. So I think we're good. And then, you know, we'll hear next spring about what's happening with um, you know what happens in the future. Which, yeah, hopefully we're still many. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone has any questions or what we think would be, um, you know, if we, we could work backwards, we usually, sometimes we do that, or if we. Um, I think that that seems to be helpful. Anybody else have any thoughts? Yeah, my recollection was that last year we started a little bit earlier, which was helpful because we built in more time so that we could go, um, um, you know, after all the proposals came in, we could go back with questions, which was, I thought, a really good, uh, you know, helpful uh, way to do it. Yeah, no, I thought that was good to have the questions and answers and then that you know we had an extra week built in there so the applicants could respond and then you know the committee could review them before making preliminary recommendations so yeah i i thought that was helpful too um i could pull up a calendar and then we could um but i was a little bit a little bit concerned because i <laughs> saw so that last year we had the um the first you know public meeting on October 29th and I was looking at the calendar this year it's like right before the election you know are people going to be focusing on this or you know what's going to be happening right before and after the election but yeah and maybe that is not a good um I know and then it's like is it good the week the week of after it or do we um, wait a fo the, to the following week um well Becky had said that she can't really be involved much before the election so that was her email today mm -hmm. I don't know, um, you know, considering her mm -hmm. request, how, how we want to finagle the schedule. Yeah, I mean, you could say something like, you know, the week of November 9th, you know, that gives us four, gives one, two, three, four weeks. We could, um, you know, we could at least start putting, um, you know, notices out there asking people for comments about what they think community priorities are, what they think, you know, it could be for the next year. Um, and then we, you know, we could schedule the, we could schedule the hearing. <clears throat> um you know like on the 10th say you know 10th is a tuesday or you know some, some something around there um and then if we wanted to um just looking at a calendar you know we can meet that you know the following week or something to review the rfps and then try to get them out there i think last year we had them out you know right around the 25th of november mm -hmm. so 
you know, it's maybe two meetings and, you know, a week after each other to get the target areas and the RFP and everything to, out there. Um, you know, we could talk about outreach strategies. I mean, I, I, you know, we can have a few more email, you know, we're not doing a lot in person, but I think through, um, you know, we have a rental assistance program and then a micro program. We have a few different databases of people we could email and let them know and ask if they have any comments or um, suggestions for priorities. So, you know, we could talk about that outreach, but does that sound good? Maybe like November 10th as a public hearing? Sure. Yeah, that's Tuesday. That's going to be a big day in the Supreme Court. Oh, what's that? That's ACA? Mm-hmm. Yep. Do we not want to? I mean, I think I, I think the news, I think the news cycle is so bad. If we if we <laughs> dance around the news cycle, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then if anyone has any ideas for outreach, you know, we can talk about it now. Or you could email me, but you know, we've talked about you know how do we get the word out for priorities. You know, I'm well. I expect the social services will come, um, and you know make a pitch for their programs, essentially, but uh, you know, if there's any I, other. I thought know. last year, Nate, the, um, the outreach that you had done resulted in some pretty interesting feedback from various, you know, whether the senior center or just other places. Um, I thought that was really helpful. Yeah, I can, I can yeah, I, that's good. I can go back to the health department and the senior center. Um, there's the um, Amherst Mobile Market, which is one we could, uh, it's a nice grassroots-led effort. Um, we could ask them to do some help with that. Do you think because yeah. everything's- Yeah, no, the health department was good. Yep. No, go ahead. I was going to say because everything's new. remote this year, do you think it's going to be more efficient, less efficient, easier, more difficult? Yeah, I mean, we could set up a form on the town's web page, uh, website, like on the committee web page, for someone to submit submit you know comments. So we could just create a pretty simple form. It could just be a one long um, you know box. You know, they could just type in you know you know, paragraphs or just one or two lines. Uh, we could make, you know, multiple choice, giving giving priorities and they could rank them in order. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, my thought is, um, you know, sometimes I feel like Zoom is good. You know, I think it can help and other times it, you know, if you don't have the ability to log on or, you know, then it's, it's hard to attend a meeting. Um, I was gonna say is we have a new health director and um, the senior center director has been there for a little bit. But yeah, I thought that was helpful when they, um, you know, they kind of canvassed a few, um, a few different maybe partners and then came back with what they were seeing in the community. So I think that's a, a good idea. Um, yeah, I mean, we have to do it over Zoom. I don't, you know, there isn't really another, but you know, in terms of trying to get people to provide comments, I mean, you know, I can, they can always email, email me or call me um, but we could maybe try setting, setting something up on the website. I mean, last year we talked about maybe doing a survey, but that hasn't, you know, we haven't, that hasn't really um, come together, but. What do people think about like an online form just with maybe an open dialogue box? Have you done, have you had much experience doing it before? Or in other yeah, we've done it before. Yeah, we we you know we've done it for different projects. Um, you know, we, we could use SurveyMonkey, or we can just use use the the platform for our web our website. Anyways, it's not it's not too hard to do. I think that's good. It's easy to for you because it just all lands in one place, and people calling or emailing you. You know, you you don't have to be, you have a barrage of interruptions <laughs> during the day that you're feeling obligated to read or listen to and everything just goes into one portal and then you check it whenever. Oh, I don't answer my phone anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, it doesn't get answered or you personally don't answer it? No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I do answer it. Although I have, um, I'm at home, so I, I'm working remotely most of the time. So I have it finally forwarded to my, um, from work to my cell phone. And um, I, I, for a while, I couldn't, I don't think people could leave messages, but they finally left a message today. I could see sometimes they would call and I would try to answer and then it would, something funny would happen. And then I never had voice messages. I'm like, what's going on? But someone left one today, so I know it's working. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a few weeks. I was unsure of myself. Um, so yeah, I think online, we could try that. We can try to reaching out to a few different places. Um, I mean, would we try reaching out to um, like United Way and see if they have any ideas for yeah. Amherst or Community Foundation? Um, that's great ideas. So if we're doing something on the, um, the website, that's like an open dialogue box, I think that sounds really, really good. But I'm also wondering if um, in addition to that, is the technology there so that there would be a spot and we have for social services activities, various types of activities that we had listed last year, have household stabilization, support services for homelessness, youth development, these things. Is it possible to have a list of those things and people could say, you know, one to five, you know, how important is this for you? Yeah, we could do that. We could set up a rank order um, question, I think, I'm pretty sure we can, so yeah. I mean, not necessarily ranking them because this, you know some might be there might be like three fives and one one, you know. But right. but just how important? Yeah, how important? Okay, is. yeah, I can. Um, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. one to five. I I can. Uh, yeah, we could do like how important on a scale of one to five or something, and they could just put a right for each of those categories. Maybe, yeah, instead of just a rank order, we could have something like that. Uh, yeah, let me, I can, I think that, that we could do that. I mean, if not on our webpage, we can do it in SurveyMonkey and then embed it uh, on, on the web, website. Yeah, I don't want to make it too complicated that would, you know, kind of be a barrier for people, but. But it makes but no, it. No, yeah, I mean. It, 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 Nate's, Nat's suggestion makes it easier for folks right. logging on. <laughs> to have the information there mm -hmm. yeah and i think as long as it's oh he froze and, and ben can easily do this he's you know <laughs> but i, I have, think this let me know <laughs> yeah no i think this, we can try this i i've set up forums before so we can uh this will work out. Mm -hmm. Does the uh, does the town have a do we have a survey monkey account? We do. Or, yep. Yeah. Yeah. But then also Civic Plus has two forms modules, so you can you can build oh, it right. right in yep. the plus and then I think that one would be easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I'm trying to think, you know, uh you know, we, I was going to say we, I can send something home through the, I can ask the schools to distribute something or, you know, I can send an email to a few people at the schools and they see and see how they can distribute that. Uh, and then if we have a web, if we have a, a link to this web page, we can include that with the email, you know, my email address. And so at least we can try to get a few things uh, outlined. So it's, it's, it is easy for comments. Yeah, the school, um, Schools have uh, PGO emails that go out to all the families. Mm, yeah. So it would be a pretty easy thing for them to include in an email, I think. Yeah, we, I, we've done that before. I just would have to find out who would do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, oh, you know, so, gee, so you know, it's kind of, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was thinking that, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully it'll be great. Hopefully by in the next few weeks, we can have some guidance from DHCD because they did mention, sorry, I was just looking at my notes that um, 
I know for the, for 19, and I thought that at one point I thought they mentioned for 20 grants because of COVID, they might lift the cap on social services. So, um, you know, that could mean either uh, you could fund more than five activities and the dollar amount uh, as a percentage of your grant could change. And so I know they were going to allow that for the 19 grant if people have any um, unencumbered funds, but, you know, we, we allocated ours already, but for the 20 grant and maybe for this year, they had, they had mentioned that there could be that possibility. So, you know, I guess we have to stay tuned, you know, for instance, what if they allow it and we hear that, you know, we hear from a, a lot of agencies or, you know, that there's a few more priorities or something. So I think, I don't want to say for certain, but, you know, maybe just, you know, and maybe that this year we end up, we could award, you know, more social services. I, I you know, don't quote me on it, but um, at one point they had mentioned that that could be a possibility, but without any guidance, I don't know that. It's just one of those things, right? I mean, it, it could change, it could change the review. Will, will they let you, will they let you know within enough time so that during our process, we, we can factor that in or, you know, cause if it's too late, it's going <laughs> to, you don't know. Yeah, no, I'm, just, I'm hoping by the end of this month, they have some documents out because otherwise then, you know, their application will be due. You know, my thought is it was, due, you know, right now the application will probably do in either late February or early March. And some, in some years they pushed it off until April. And so, you know, if they don't get their information out soon enough, you know, then they might push the application deadline back. So, you know, we could either then delay our process a little bit or, you know, um, I think we could, uh, my assumption is let's start with the mid February application, late February application date. And I like the November 10th hearing date and then we can just kind of work from there. And if we need to adjust, we could, but. I know the housing authority and some others have already asked about, um, you know, this grant cycle. So I know there's still interest in, you know, uh, both so social services and capital projects. So I'm assuming we'll get, you know, the, the kind of the normal response and, of, you know, both social service and, and infrastructure projects. All right, so we, if we like that, I can, we can talk about that for outreach. I mean, that seems pretty good for now. Um, if we meet on the 10th, usually, I mean, the hearing might not be a long time. We could either just have that be the hearing. I think we did that last year. And then the following week we had a meeting to review the, you know, RFPs and the criteria and everything. So would we want to do that? So, you know, if we meet on the 10th, we, then we meet again on the 17th, um, to talk about getting the, the draft documents in, in good shape. Is that? Sure. Right. And Becky, if you want to, if you ever have a question or a comment, you can raise your hand and Gail or I can recognize you. Um. One quick question, um, thinking about people to reach out to. So yeah, you said, so Julie is um, retiring, right? She yeah. is. Uh, yeah. So, but I'm wondering if there are other town of Amherst department heads that who might make sense to ask. Um, so I'm thinking about, I mean, you would know much better, Nate, but I'm thinking about, um, like senior services, right? There's someone there. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, yeah, maybe Mike Morris. Yeah. Right? Schools. And I mean, I don't know, there aren't a lot of people who are obvious to me who you know, wouldn't have incentive necessarily to just push their own thing. And we'll get, you know, lots of input from, yeah, all the sort of social service and other folks anyway. But I, right. I think it is helpful. You know, I mean, what you, what Julie did last time even was helpful, I thought. I mean, if we can tap just a couple other three people. Right. In addition to sort of United Way and so on. Anyway, if you know any, or if anyone has ideas about who those couple, three other people might be, that would be great. But I think senior services, I'd be interested to hear what that person has to say. I don't know who yeah. that is. Yeah, I know Mary Beth, um, she's the director of the Senior Center. I'll reach out to her. She's, she was new, I think, last year. So she's been there maybe a little over a year now, actually a year and a half. So she, but she's really um, 
pretty active and I think in, in touch with a lot. So she, she'll be good. And um, the new health director, I think is somewhat local too. So she may actually have, um, you know, so may be able to provide some, some insight, but I like the idea. I, um, if not Mike Morris, I know there's uh, Faye Brady was with the schools and um, I have another name. I'm, um, I have an email from someone else. I think I could, you know, that would work with uh, both of the local and regional schools that could offer some help. Becky has, her hand, Becky has her hand raised, but um, I don't know how to call on her. I've never done it. I, if you unmute yourself, you, you can speak. Okay, I just unmuted myself. Um, I just sent an email actually um, because I w couldn't figure out quite how to get in, but can you all hear me now? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, one thought, I, and maybe you do this all the time, but was to um, post the survey on the, in the COSA newsletter and to ask people to send it out to their constituents for all those organizations. Mm -hmm. Yep. No, I, I sent it to COSA and okay. um, the uh, Amherst has an Amherst Human Service Network, um, which a lot of the agencies overlap with COSA, but I usually send it to those two uh, umbrella organizations. Okay. And that's good. Yeah, that's yeah, actually, yeah. So we can work on the, I think we have to work on the web page first so we can get a link to it, you know, for comments and we can send that out and COSA could easily distribute it that way as well. Yeah. Uh, that'll work. And sorry, apologies for being half an hour behind, but are you saying that you're transitioning off this over the next few months for good? Uh, I think so. The, um, you know, I probably see through this application round and then, you know, for say like the next year's application round, uh, I, you know, I'd be, I'd be in, I'd be in the backseat and Ben would be uh, taking the lead role. Mm -hmm. mm. Although with everything that's happened in the last six months, you know, there are some ideas that I was going to start staffing the planning board and maybe doing some other boards and committees and that hasn't happened. So it's, you know, it was an idea of how to rearrange staff. Well, Nate, I'm sorry to hear about your demotion. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, for a while I was staffing, I think like six boards and committees. Yeah. And they, yeah, it's nice that Ben's on board. We were short. We were kind of shorthanded for a bit, and so um, you know, it was, it was, I was pretty busy. Granted, this has always been a committee of mine, so yeah. it'll be different not to be involved. And I know the state is comfortable with me. It's funny they weren't at first. You know, now I've been there. <laughs> they are. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we can s send emails from your account still or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll give you my login information so they think it's. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'll be and I'll be here for this round. Um, yeah, so if anyone has ideas for outreach, let me know. I think the schools are good. Um, the senior center, uh, you know, we can. Yeah, I'm curious to see how it looks online. I hope it, I'm hoping it's an easy, you know, way for people to just either rank, you know, not rank, but identify their priorities in terms of services, and then you know, have an easy box for them to type, uh, you know, even if it's just, you know, a few paragraphs or even a few lines, it's, you know, pretty clear to them, to the user how to do that. So that'll be something new. And let me just ask, let me just write the Jones Library just to make. And then the 17th, we can, you know, I, I emailed them out. So anyone, you know, from now and, you know, at any time, if you just want some, you know, nightly reading, you could look over the RFPs and the review criteria <laughs> and see if we want to change anything. I feel like every year we make a little tweak that gets, a, you know, to be better. So um, I think last year's worked pretty well, having the page limit and I mean, a few more. Um, I think we were a little clear on what we were asking for in the budget uh, helped. And I do like, the, I did like, I wasn't sure I was going to, but I did like having the questions being asked and then having applicants respond. I think that really helped clarify things for the committee before making recommendations, so. I feel bad it was more work for you, but I think it really helped the committee. <laughs> yeah, no, it, wasn't, it wasn't too bad for me. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, um, yeah, I, I do like that. I mean, I think, you know, I think last year some people asked about having presentations from the applicants again. And, you know, I guess that's a committee question, you know, is that, you know, is that worth the time of having someone present their proposal and that be part of the, the, um, 
you know, they do that before the committee makes recommendations. So would we have, you know, a presentation by all the applicants as part of the review process? You know, that's, you know, it's, it's your, as a committee, that can be your decision. I don't. Anyone have any, any thoughts there? I guess my initial instinct is that it doesn't sound like it would be very additive. Very what, Nate? No. It, uh, it would not be very additive to the process. Okay. I'm just not sure there'd be much added value once we're at that point. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think it's more useful to, um, more helpful to, you know, be able to read and think on it a bit, organize whatever questions we have and then be able to ask that as opposed to a live, unless we're saying we would read it beforehand and then they would come and essentially present them what we just read, which then right. you know, doesn't feel additive either. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what, right. They would still submit their proposals and then, you know, there'd be a hearing where, you know, the committee would have read the proposals and then they'd make a presentation on what they submitted. But, you know, I think the question and answer back and forth was probably more helpful than a presentation. Um, you know, you, you know, everyone was you know, really thoughtful about what they were asking. So. And I guess just one question, um, Nate, I'm wondering, it. you know, so, yeah, so we, we, um, were stricter on the page limit, mm -hmm. right? Or made it clear that, yeah, you know, the what 15 pages is all inclusive, right? Right. <clears throat> and I just wonder if any of the people who were used to effectively longer um, um, you know, sub submissions complained, has anyone suggested that 15 pages really isn't sufficient to provide the information asked for? I think there are some, uh, there are some. Um, I think there was, you know, some challenges maybe with some, com uh, some agencies to, to get it to 15 pages because I'd like to put in a lot of information. Um, I will say that DHCD in the last two years, maybe because they're, you know, running um, less staff as well, they, they, they're stricter on their page limit. So, so some of the issue is, for instance, when, um, when the town submits for a social service activity to DHCD, they only want three to four pages describing that program, um, a budget page, and maybe some beneficiary information. They don't, they don't care about all the um, attachments. And so even if an agency submits it to the town and I submit it to DCD, I'm not sure that they read it all. And so, you know, when an agency used to submit 40 pages, I remember one year the reviewer was like, they wrote in one of the comments, it's too long we can't read this, you know, they, you know, a reviewer might review seven communities, 10 communities, and they're not going to spend the time. So they're, the HCD has gotten really strict about page limit. So I think last year I felt good about having that page limit because it's in turn, it makes it easier for the town to then, um, you know, I, I ask the applicants after uh, the town manager recommends them, I work with the applicants to refine their description so that we can submit a really good package to DHCD. And so if they, if they're actually writing too much, it's actually harder to then, you know, refine it for the town's application. So, you know, I think some, I think there were some challenges to, you know, maybe to do that, but I didn't, you know, um, I think there were more questions at first about what, you know, how do they, what do they put in their, you know, in those pages, but I don't, I'm not sure if people really complained, but. It's a good so, question, Andrew. So I'm wondering, we're talking about the uh, apps that we re initially read and then have people come in um, mm -hmm. for that next week's meeting. If we could limit how many people say the same thing and have it uh, be more focused on questions and answers that we might develop in reading them and having them there to respond, I think might be helpful. If we, can we do that? Is there some way to say that? Um, that would be in the review meeting, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think that's, 
the committee can discuss that and then you know the chair and I can help try to you know um, allow, you know to kind of run the meeting it is difficult though when it's a public hearing and you know you you know we have to allow the public to speak and then they they repeat themselves so I think Gail last year did say a few times to people that we've heard that can we can we move on but if someone you know just starts speaking it's difficult to anticipate what they're going to say so sometimes it, does, it may be repetitive but um, well, I think the way we formatted it last year is that if there were multiple representatives of one organization, we would in other organizations only had one person, we'd go down A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But if there were three people for B, we would go back to B after everybody at least had one representative speak. Like you couldn't have four people in a row speaking about your organization in, in um, a bit of lack of a term, like sucking up the time of other people who hadn't had a chance to speak yet. So I thought that that seemed like a fair way to do it. <clears throat> but I also think limiting yeah. to have four people saying the same thing about the survival center, as Nat says, it's not additive, it's just repetitive. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, I, I think, you know, so, it, you know, is there then, um, you know, in the request for proposals or in the review criteria, I mean, is there a statement that says, you know, um, something like, you know, limit the number of people speaking, you know, presenting to the committee? I mean, is there, is there, you know, it, would we want to write something like that? I mean, yeah, last year the Survival Center, you know, lined up their speakers, which was really strange because I called on someone and then Lev's like, no, they're not supposed to talk in that order. And it's like, well, you know, maybe it was during the, the CARES funding round. It's like, well, I mean, really? Like you've teed them up so that, you know, you're like, it's like, you know, this, you know, I don't know. I just, that's not. Built to the climax, huh? I mean, yeah. you, can, you can see it in a kind way in that, you know, we asked that no more than three representatives s speak on whatever date we're doing this. Just I mean, yeah, if the committee likes that, we could put that in, we could put that in the review, you know, the criteria or in the request for proposals. It doesn't have anything to do with the proposal they submit, but it's just, you know, previewing how the committee would review proposals. You know, you could say something like, you know, at, at time of review with the committee, please, you know, limit, you know, your, you know, to three representatives who speak for your proposal or something. I mean, we could put it out there just as a, I would, not, not to be too contrarian, but I would almost worry the opposite, that if we say no more than three, that every organization will come up with three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, so give us, give us some better language around that. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Just a quick... Yeah, maybe it's something we just do. Go ahead, Sorry, Andrew. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Nate. Oh, no, I was just going to say, it's like when we, sometimes we go out to bid, if you put a bid price or an estimate, everyone bids the estimate. It's like they don't actually then, they don't do any thinking about it. You know, if you say something's going to be 50,000, everyone bids 50,000. You know, they don't, you know, they don't really come up with their own price. No, I mean, I find so, yeah. the, what I find myself wondering, um, when I to Nat's point, is what additive would look like actually in that context, right? So my own sense is that, you know, obviously we haven't really spoken about this and, you know, probed how each of us thinks about these things, but I really doubt that any of those, right, sort of public comments, certainly the, the folks who are, you know, the clients, they, I mean, it's nice to hear and especially, um, I mean, it's just night for me, certainly, as right. This is new exposure for me, so I like. But I don't. I really don't think it does anything to my assessment, right? I think it adds nothing to how I assess those proposals, which is what it's all about. The proposals, and then the conversation among us, is ninety nine point nine percent, if not a hundred, <laughs> and I suspect that's true for all of us. I could be wrong. So it's not even so much the repetitiveness, it's sort of, I mean, it could be complementary, but at least to date, I can't think of a time that I think what I've heard, you know, even from Lev, right, who I think is most, is super organized and there are a bunch of people, I don't think that adds 
more information, more to my consideration of those proposals. So then I'm wondering what would additive look like, right? Like beyond what goes in the proposal, what could someone say? And is there a way to give guidance around that as opposed to number of people? And obviously number of people can, you know, can be an, an issue in itself, but I, I honestly just don't know what that is that would really add more grist for the mill of our consideration, you know, of who gets money and how much they get. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we used to allow more pages and then they were like testimonials or encomiums that, that were attached. And then we kind of limited the page, the pages and that eliminated that process, right? Mm -hmm. and that's really, that's mostly what we're getting, right? Is testimonials. Mm -hmm. So, and I should say, I mean, you know, we could say, those testimonials or you know whatever we call them are not just about our consideration right that there is actually value in having people who support the programs be able to say that publicly clearly they find value in that and maybe that's you know and maybe that's sufficient right and then yes it's just about you know how much time they can take collectively or a number of people or you know whatever it is but but that's still a different thing right it's a different value than Okay, I'm going to take that away and I'm going to, you know, that's going to affect the decision I actually make. Yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. You know, when the town does any, you know, procurement review, we rarely have testimonials, right? We have references, but we don't, you know, I, I do think the, the, the testimonial is a different, right, a different value. The, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't have a really good answer. I mean, we could have a, a, a call out in the RFP that says, you know, we're, we al we'd allow, you know, exclusive of the page limit or something is, you know, we could have so many pages of testimonials or something. You know, some agencies used to really stack the deck and they'd have like 10 people speak to an agency. And so, you know, now I'll tell people, you know, maybe bring two or three, maybe, maybe four at the most. I mean, they ask sometimes. And I also, We'll say that if a you know um, a participant is uncomfortable, please don't please don't have them speak in front of the committee thinking it's compulsory as part of the participation in this program, right? So I, sometimes I felt like maybe participants thought they had to speak, and it was you know part you know as part of their requirement of of say attending a class or something. And I I I, I don't want that to be thought. That, I don't want them to think that way, right? We're not we're not providing money to agencies to then have um, people who maybe too, you know, nervous or, or something that didn't speak in front of the committee. And so I think they've been good about it, but you know, a uh, number of years ago, I mean, I was surprised at how many people would speak and they would seem really uncomfortable and really nervous. And I couldn't tell if they wanted to speak or how, if they were pressured, but you know, I feel like the ones in the last two years have been pretty good, but agreed if they're not helping the committee assess the proposals, you know, how do we factor that in? Do we factor it in or how do we, then how do we shape it uh, as part of the review process. And I don't even know if this needs to be said. I'll, I'll just, but I'll just offer that, um, you know, mostly what I get from those typically is the speaker thinks the work is really, really important and it's really touched their lives and it's an invaluable service to them, their families, their kids, et cetera. And, and that's almost, that's never the issue with us, right? I mean, there's just no doubt about that, uh, right. certainly in, in, the, in terms of the social services. So, like, we believe you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, again, though, I wonder, I mean, I, I don't know if it's, I, I'm, I'm still wondering, is there something that's not in the proposal and doesn't amount to an expression of, right? that person's investment in that program so that we could give some guidance I and mean, i'm not i don't i'm not identifying anything myself mm. and again just to go back to the other thing and, and and if there isn't something do we say okay that's that's okay still again there is value in giving people a space right to offer that that testimony because it's important to them and it's important to you know the agency heads you know enjoy having right appreciate having 
people speak for them publicly like that and and you know in the in the scheme of things there's actually not that much time that they're asking of us right so we're just going to provide that form and that's okay Could yeah, there be? I will say that as a public hearing, we can't, if people want to speak, we can't limit it. It's just, you know, if an agency w wants to, you know, have 10 people come, you know, um, that's something different where it does get repetitive. But, um, you know, as a public hearing, it's open to the public. So, um, yeah, that's all. I was just going to say that even if, even if we, even if they are, there are program participants, you know, we still have to let them speak, you know, and they may not have been, you know, even if it's been uh, coordinated with the agency as a public hearing, we can't really say no unless we, unless we all of a sudden say, well, we've already heard that. Do you have something else you can add? But um. Daniel, is there any way that um, we can ask people not to solicit people to come and speak? Because I thought it was pretty clear that some people uh, had been asked to come and, and uh, participate to show numbers. Um, and, and that I didn't find helpful, but I did find it helpful to hear from some of the people that had participated. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that's something, you know, I think it's all part of the same question that, you know, you, Paul, you've asked and Andrew's talked about how, what's, you know, is it, you know, is there a way to fold this into the process? Or if not, is it, you know, does it really, does it, it doesn't take too much time. So is it still important just to hear it? Um, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I mean we, we don't have to answer that tonight, but I think it's something we could, you know, just think about over the next few weeks. I mean, we could say as, you know, as the hearings um, before the public meetings, I mean, it may not be formally written in the, um, in the RFP, but we could tell people, you know, limit it to, two or three people to speak um, to the organization or to the proposal. And, you know, that way someone doesn't come in and have, you know, a number of people that are, you know, are kind of choreographed to speak to it. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Um, but I think that's, you know, Nat, um, Nat, I think, and Andrew, you said it, that there wasn't, they didn't help a lot with the assessment of the proposals. And I guess for me, that's, it's the question then is, well, what, you know, what, what's the better, what's the purpose of it? Like, or how can we make it part of the, the review, you know, or it can, or is it just, you know, would having written testimonials then as part of the proposal, do we have a, you know, some, something that, that we allow for some of those as part of the proposal, you know, and, you know, we get those up front as part of the review, because if they're, you know, I, I agree. I mean, it is nice sometimes to have the personal touch and understand what's happening from an attendee's, you know, a participant's perspective. But if it's not necessarily helping the committee assess and evaluate proposals, then, uh, you know, I, I don't, you know, does it need to be, how, how does it, how, then how is it part of the process or does it need to be part of the process, I guess? Um, it's tugging, it's tugging at our heartstrings, just like the Supreme Court hearings when you hear, you know, senators bring the people that have benefited from Affordable Care Act and they're just sitting there and you're hearing about their stories and it's tugging, it's, it's the emotional component. But I don't, I agree with Andrew that I don't think it factors into my decision because you're doing it not just for one person, but you know, relatively for the, for the entire organization. I was wondering if- you know, I, I bet it doesn't move any senators either. <laughs> Rose me. <laughs> well, you were you were undecided, were you, Gail? <laughs> if we took like an eight and a half by eleven, and we did like two boxes, and we did two pages of that, so we could get four testimonials, like does that that would only add two pages? I know, I mean, we're kind of in the weeds right now, and it feels premature, but I'm just throwing it out there. Or my thought is if we said 15 pages for the application and then we could say we allow an additional five pages of testimony or, or, you know, or something or, you know, like, or participant uh, statements or something. I mean, I don't know, two pages of participant statements. I mean, there's maybe a way to do it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the, 
it's um, there are some people who would write who wouldn't speak, and there are some people who would speak who won't, who wouldn't write. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, as a public hearing, we have to allow you know people to submit written comment, or if they want to speak at the hearing, we you know we we have, we allow, we have to allow that. So, but you know at least we could find a way to encourage the organizations not to kind of grandstand everyone. Um, right. All right, Becky, you're free to speak if you. Okay, <laughs> obviously I've never done this before. Um, and I can imagine that the meeting's going long and maybe that's part of the, the issue here. But I guess I would just say is, um, I'm just coming out of the process of, of starting um, or helping to facilitate the opening of a new community organization. And what I hear from members of the community is how much people want to be heard and how much they don't feel heard right now. So I guess I would just throw that out there as, um, you know, if it's not, too much trouble on the part of the committee to hear everybody and to let people really speak what they're feeling right now. I think it's that serves its own purpose for people to feel that the that the board is really understanding from the constituents who are in the community what's going on. So even if it feels like a huge time that it, it's taking up so much time and it's not particularly helpful to making a decision, it may be helpful in other ways. Sorry, and I realize you can't see me, which I don't know why my phone isn't doing that, but so you don't know that. Oh, I, just I, I can promote, I mean, you know what, I, you're an attendee. I can promote you to panelists. Oh, um, it's okay. I just, no, I just did that. That way, if you wanted to be visible, to. you could. I'm, Yeah, so if, yeah, all right. So you're panelists now, so you get to speak freely now and not. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to have a process where people feel like they, um, they don't think the committee is listening. Um, I'm not sure that's, that's it. I think, um, yeah, uh, you know, the, I think one thing that, you know, usually in the hearing we're talking about in November, we ask for public uh, comments on priorities and usually agencies come and they really just promote their, you know, their program. And so we, we're trying to talk about a better way to get community input then earlier on in the process about what are community priorities and what are things that the funding could help. Um, and then, you know, the comments we're talking about now are when um, agencies have actually submitted proposals and the community is reviewing them. Sometimes, you know, agencies or an applicant may line up, you know, seven people to speak to the proposal during the committee review process and Sometimes it's helpful and it sounds like sometimes it's not, you know, maybe good to have, you know, personal testimony, but it doesn't necessarily affect the rating of the, of the program. And uh, Gail, it was interesting. You said, right. It's only one person. It's not the program. I mean, it's nice to hear the value to them of the program, but it may not actually help the committee determine if the program is you know, feasible or has good capacity or organizational structure. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think, but there, I, I, I would like to maybe try to find a way to capture those, you know, that some of that, that personal testimony, whether it's like, you know, some added pages during the proposal submission or something, but we don't have to solve it tonight. But um. I mean, I, I would actually, so that, that said, I, I mean, I would put in a vote for essentially keeping it as it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do think and you know, as opposed to actually the pages, um, the pages of testimonial at the end. I mean, I, I do think that, um, or my guess is that a big part of the value again is being able to speak publicly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it's you know, as much as anything, a signal folks send each other, right? right. They send to the agency head, and mm -hmm. sort of public appreciation is just important. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, I think it's not you know actually you know so much time. I mean, I'm you know. It doesn't always feel awesome right? <laughs> when you hear the you know nth person, um, but but I I get it. I mean, as long as we are, I think, aware as we're being now of what's happening there and why we're doing it, right? Um, it's yeah, really I think purpose, not that purpose. That's I think that's okay. Yeah, and I think if we're clear that you know the proposal review is based on say what's written and some other things, so people you know there's not a false assumption that, you know, it's a public hearing and they're trying to sway the committee one way or the other that, you know, it's, yeah, because I think, um, you know, we used to do that years ago. And I think sometimes people still think that 
the public, you know, presentation or, or the, you know, someone speaking is going to have the committee change their mind at the last minute. And maybe it helps you think of something, but I don't, yeah, I think if we can frame it the right way, it can still be helpful. Um, so. All right, so if we're, I just want to talk schedule of November 10th and November 17th, you know, then the rest is on me to pull together the documents and say to try to get them out by the end of November. And I think last year, um, um, you know, we, I think we gave, we gave applicants five weeks to submit their proposal. And that seemed, you know, plenty generous, granted there's holidays in there, but I mean, uh, when would we want, I guess the question is, when would we want proposals to be due by? Usually do it right, like right at Christmas, right? <laughs> yeah, last yeah, year, it's the 23rd, I think. Such a bad time of year. Um, if we they go out on the if they go out on the thirtieth, it's really one, two, three. It's like three and a half weeks. That's not, does that we feel? Meet, the committee meets on the seventeenth, and we can finalize the you know the documents. I could get them out on the twentieth, November twentieth. Well, that would be better. One, two, three, four, and then got them back right before Christmas on the 18th. <clears throat> sure. Does that feel like enough time? Well, no, so then, then the question is, um, the committee would need to review them and then provide me questions. And then I'd ask applicants um, to respond. So let's just, let me just write November uh, 20th, uh, RFP out, and we're saying, December 18th, they're due. And then um, when would they see? Um, and then we'd read them like through the holiday break. Be yeah. Done. So when I mean that's the question. Like, how? What? 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 What would be a good time for the committee to then, over those holidays, to read the proposals and give me questions? Would you say, you know, have questions to me by Monday, January fourth? I mean, is that it's fine with me? And then you know, I'd ask applicants to respond by the eleventh, and then you know the committee could meet that week, um, or the following week and have the meeting to um, to make preliminary recommendations. Does that give you enough time for the February deadline? Oh, he's frozen. But he's poised for action, isn't he? <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't wait to see what comes next. This is crazy. <laughs> Looks like he's about to push that chair back and right. head out. <laughs> what are you going to say? This is <laughs> tension. I'm sure you're really funny. You think you can hear uh, us still? I can't see him. He's frozen. Oh. Huh. There you go. Okay, so he made you the host and probably just backed out of the meeting. Me the host? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, hold on. No, I asked him if we go, if the questions, we send questions to Nate on the 4th mm -hmm. and the committees and then the applicants get the com questions back to us on the 11th. My question the 11th. Was, yeah. was, is that enough time for him? For, then we make our recommendation and then he's got to rewrite everything by February, but does he have the date in February yet? Uh, I'm not sure offhand. Is it is that typically early February for the recommendation deadline? I don't. I, I'm not sure. Okay. But I think it sounds fine. If we, I mean, yeah. we don't. Have, we could. I mean, we could. We're 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 just kind of hashing out these dates right now. <clears throat> so I think it sounds okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
the up so we send we would read over the christmas holidays everybody okay with that and we're going to have two new committee members too who are going to have to take itch some time out of the holidays mm -hmm. well i don't want to be traveling anywhere how about that yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, say, again, say again the date by which we would get the proposals so we would they would be due the rfp would go out on the 20th of november that the rfps would be due back to Nate and then he would turn them around and get them to us on December 18th. And then we would have from the 18th of December until January 4th, which is one, two, a little over two weeks, um, two and a half weeks to read them. And then we would submit questions. Oh no, I'm looking at the wrong calendar. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. 18th, um, one, two, yeah, a little over two weeks. We would get questions to Nate on the 4th if we had any questions on any of the proposals that would then he would turn around and then give those questions back to the applicants, the applicants would have one week to therefore respond to those questions and get the questions back to Nate. And then he turns around and gets them back to us on the 11th. That's, I think that's kind of what we did the, the kind of the time. I don't have my calendar from last year. I do um, to see how we did it last year. Yes, yeah, so last year we met on the 15th of January after we had the responses to questions and everything. Okay. And when did the, um, when did, I'm just looking here. Oh, hey everyone. Sorry, I, I, uh, I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. I think it's the same basic schedule. It's the Monday after the holiday that um, we sent our questions to Nate last year. So I think we're following the same pattern. Yeah, Nate, Ben, ben somehow kicked you out of them talk smack about you. It was awful. <laughs> <laughs> it was not good. It was not good. Good, good thing this is all that recorded, though. Oh, yeah. Uh oh. Um, so I think my question to you when you froze was if um, the applicants respond to the questions on the 11th and we move forward as we typically do, is that going to give you enough time to get everything together in February? Because would you have your date in February already? That's, that's, the, that's what we were talking about. No, last year was due on like the 12th. It was like the week, the day, you know, the right around Valentine's Day. So um, if the applicants respond by the 11th, we could have a meeting like January, we could either, we could, you know, meet on the 14th and that, does that give the committee enough time to review the questions or do you want to meet the following week on the 19th? Um, it's really up to the committee, I guess. Well, last year, the comments came back to us on the 13th and we had the yep. public hearing on the 15th. So we only had okay. two days to turn it around. So I, I'm fine with, keep, I like to keep the process moving. I think it, it keeps it fresh in our brain. Okay. So January 14th would be a public meeting uh, to review, to make recommendations. And then, you know, after the rec recommendations, I provide that to the town manager, and then we could schedule a public hearing for, uh, you know, late January, like the 28th or something, February 2nd, something like that. Mm -hmm. That cuts it, it's not too cutting it too short for you. Um, you work better under pressure. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, 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 a little, it's a little close. I'm hoping DHCD pushes the deadline back maybe to the end of February okay. and that'll work. You know, if not, then um, nice. Um, sorry, some interruptions there. Um, I think that's fine. I think that's fine. I think it gives the you know, applicants enough time to respond, the committee to review them. I don't mind being a little pressured just to allow that. Okay. And, and I have Ben to help me now. Yeah, so I was gonna you. say, I'm here, Nate. Off, offload some <laughs> stuff on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if anyone plays Dragonwood, if you know the card game Dragonwood. That's what it's called? I oh. don't know that. My youngest just came in to say he beat his sister in Dragonwood, so you know. Oh. Big news. It is. All right. So yeah, I mean, I guess if um, I can share screen again, if um, 
yeah, I think, you know, until I hear otherwise from DHCD, I think this seems like a pretty good schedule. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, committee members, if you have any questions or comments on the actual documents or review criteria, we could, you know, you can let me know anytime and then we can talk about it again in, the, you know, November. I think the, um, you know, I always feel like people still have questions about what we're asking for in the budget, you know, for whatever reason. And so I thought we clarified that a little bit last year, but if people read it and you still think it's not, you know, it's not clear enough, just, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be offended if you want to change some things, but, you know, because we, we ask for a program budget and sometimes we ask for the, you know, the agency's operational budget and they are two separate things. And I think it does help show capacity and feasibility. And sometimes I feel like, I don't, for whatever reason, that just seems to sometimes get, be difficult for agencies to separate those two or explain the two, but. Okay. All right, and let me just do a new share. Um, according to the agenda, we're gonna look at um, target areas and you know, DCD, I still think is gonna require the town to target, um, you know, non-social service projects, so, you know, infrastructure or housing. And so the last few years we've used these three target areas, one's Amherst Center, can everyone see the, this, the map? Yeah. yeah. Amherst Center in red, um, East Amherst in orange, and then the Pomeroy Village intersection in, uh, it's kind of purplish. Um, so, you know, if we want to change those, we can. You know, the difficulty, for instance, is if, um, you know, someone proposes a project that's not in these target areas, it's, it's essentially um, ineligible. So, you know, what DHCD likes to think of as a target area is a place, you know, a, some type of, you know, cohesive area where the town is doing some work and where other things are happening. So, um, you know, we can justify these pretty easily in terms of the infrastructure work that's happening and what the town is considering. Um, I don't think DHCD would allow the town to have more than three target areas. So we couldn't, you know, for a while we had North Amherst, we had four. And a few years ago, DHCD said you really can't have four target areas, um, which is kind of a bummer because, you know, we had a nice big nor uh, North Amherst target area. <laughs> uh, so, you know, if we, if we want to add one, we have to remove one. So, I, you know, it's just something to consider moving forward. How would we, you know, do we like these areas? And North Amherst has all that development now, so it feels like, you know, things have changed in a positive way there. So they wouldn't right. have the need. The need would be, is not as great. And I guess, you know, I'd have to update this, but the green areas are the income eligible uh, block groups in town. So the areas in green, shaded in green were the income eligible areas. I think it may have changed actually. I thought this was, uh, I'm assuming this is the 2020, the, um, I don't know, maybe the 2000, I'd have to, I'm not sure what data we use for this, but, um, you know, maybe it's changed a little bit in terms of the block groups, but let me make a note to actually update the map. Nathaniel, what about the um, library in North Amherst? Is that um, usable since population is going to, you know, increase substantially down there. Yeah, uh, hold on, income eligible blockers. The, um, when North Amherst was a target area, we did put block grant money into the North Amherst school a number of years ago to, you know, for building envelope repairs and a few things. And then, you know, Head Start was in there and the survival center was in the basement. Um, you know, so the difficulty now is it's no longer in, although it's not in an income eligible area, it's not in a target area. So, you know, that's what makes it somewhat tricky. You know, for instance, um, you know, it could be a good area, um, but I mean, we could try to say North Amherst as a fourth target area and see if we get any pushback. Can I just ask if you take the, the area to the left of the red block mm -hmm. and that kind of goes up towards the top is that North Amherst, those kind of 
three blocks to the, that are in that, yeah, right in there. Is, is that North Amherst? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this is um, the University of Massachusetts, and then this is uh, North Pleasant Street. Okay. So this right here is the intersection of North Pleasant and Meadow Street. So, you know, here's okay. the North Amherst Library, right where the cursor is, and then, you know, here's Route 63 going up. Okay. And... So, you know, originally, you know, at one point the target area was, you know, something in this area, just because we were, you know, putting money into trying to work with the roadways and the school and, um, but, you know, for, you know, for instance, this area right here, you know, the town's looking at acquiring Hickory Ridge, we've been doing the Groff Park and, you know, the East Hadley Road work. And so it fits into this um, target area. We've been trying to talk about maybe doing some public infrastructure improvements to this intersection, making it more accessible you know, East Amherst, there's been some work uh, happening in here. We have the East Amherst School. And then the town center is kind of this, just this big area. The, did the spray park ever get finished? It did, and then um, it did. It was open for a little bit. And then I, unbeknownst to me, near the end of the season, it was it was closed. I don't, I don't, I don't think it was actually broken. There was a, a warranty issue, but to be safe, because it was near the end, the town closed it. So I actually went, you know, there was like a hot day in late September and I was like, oh yeah, let's go down. We were down there once. I'm like, let's go back down to the, the spray pad. And so the kids got really excited. It was like 3.30, we get down there. They're all wearing their like swim outfits. And uh, you know, it's all dry. And I'm like, huh, so I'm like hitting the button. I'm like, I don't know why it's not working. And I see like a handwritten sign saying close for repairs. And the kids were so annoyed. And I look around and like half the kids in the playground all had their bathing suits on. And then while we were sitting there, like four more families came and the kids are like running. Like smacking the thing and it wouldn't start and it was so funny just because we had just experienced the same feeling of disappointment <laughs> we get to see it so fun. <laughs> but it did it, it was finished and um um uh, you know there, there was something a little bit more work there we're actually applying i think for some cpa funds to fix the lower pavilion and um yeah i mean it was i was surprised actually how i was there a few times this summer it was really busy it's good. Okay. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of people there. Great. Yeah, so target areas, yeah, we will have to target. So I guess, um, you know, and, and they're not set in stone. So I guess I would say that if, you know, for the capital, the non-social service activities, if, if we get a lot of proposals for a certain area of town, you know, at the public hearing, the committee has the ability to say, okay, well, I think this area should be a target area. We could, we could always, manipulate it a little bit if we need to. Um, but, you know, I know the housing authority might come in with a proposal, the town might come in with one or two. I don't really know, you know, I haven't been hearing about much, but. Okay. And um, yeah, I don't know if there's any, I mean, if we don't, we don't need to necessarily go through the proposals right now or the, you know, the request for proposals. Excuse me, so I don't, I mean, unless there's that much, anything else to talk about, I guess we could, you know, I can send the schedule out and we can say November 10th would be a public hearing and we, you know, we'd be all set until then. Sounds good. Any, uh, any comments or any, anything? Mm -hmm. like oh, I guess my, I do have a quick question. Do you know when the potential new appointees will, when the town council is meeting next to um, confirm the new appointees? Um, I, I, you know, I, I thought um, soon. I know Paul had mentioned, um, you know, if not this week, then next week. So, you know, I think they're trying, I think there's more than just this committee. So I think there might be a number of committees that they'll review appointees for. So I'm hoping it's soon, mm -hmm. at least by the 10th, because, um, you know, it'd be great to, I know, it's, I think the, um, you know, Becky, who was on the call earlier, she has some experience, at least in, you know, some proposal review, not with block grant, but uh, the other two members, I don't think they have. Um, well, Rika, Rika did, but not not in this capacity right and so i think it's going to be a learning curve for the newer <laughs> member so you know um it's nice that they're that we have some but yeah it'd be nice if they yeah Gail. my thought is if they're 
if their confirmations are, or their appointments are confirmed soon, you know, you know, you and I could meet with them over Zoom yeah. again. And, I was thinking and about that. Sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let me just make a note to that. I just, I, I can reach out to them and. Um, yeah. If you let yeah. them know that they, that we have the uh, November 10th mm -hmm. schedule. And actually, since that's a public hearing, technically they wouldn't have to be part of the committee to attend and listen anyway. So. Right, true, right, yep. Yeah, and I've, I've emailed everyone at least so that they, you know, I've sent them links to DHD's webpage and to the committee's webpage and the documents. So at least they're all, you know, they have the ability to do a little homework if, even if they're not on the committee yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and is it, um, I can't think of the word, uh, acceptable for you to share our contact information with them, each of us individually, once they're, Confirm so if they want to reach out to any of us for questions. Yeah, I think, yeah, you know, they can, um, my email, you know, list has everyone's email address, but that's all I would share. I don't, you know, oh, unless no, the committee wants to have some type of, I don't, I don't, you know, wouldn't really share personal and other information, even, you know, unless someone, you know, Gail, for instance, as chair, if you're like, oh, you, they could have my phone number, but otherwise I'll just leave it to the emails. And okay. They can, reach out. Yeah. Typically we don't provide, you know, personal contact information for border committee no, members. No, no, I didn't mean like, you know. Yeah, I know, yeah. Show up at yeah. your house, but not that that would be funny. <laughs> Who gives out the best Halloween candy? <laughs> <laughs> I guess they'll also have public meeting law training so they know like what they can't talk to us about. <laughs> yeah, when they, um, when they're, um, when their appointments confirmed, the town clerk's office would send them the open meeting law guide and a packet of information, and then they have to take like the uh, ethics online training. So, yeah, I'm assuming all that you know, we I could touch on that. Uh, let me just write that down. Um, but usually, that's through the town clerk's office. Then I would, you know, I would just help them understand the block grant piece. But I, we could talk about the open meeting law too, because I think some of them are new to even open meeting law, like the. You know, during the interviews, we mentioned how everything has to be done in a public meeting, and you really can't be discussing, you know, things with committee members outside the meeting. And I think that was new to some of them. And it is different. I mean, you know, to be able to have to talk publicly about proposals, you know, and the the applicant is sitting in the meeting, <laughs> it's a little different. Yeah, that'd be great to have them. Um, and then I can, we can outline the schedule and if we need to adjust a few dates, we can, but I think, I think we've given ourselves a, you know, a good schedule to work with and the applicants, you know, everyone enough time. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess that's it. We could always uh, get end by 830. Right. So, so which of you does give out the best Halloween candy? <laughs> My girls need to know. <laughs> well, G Gail and I live next door and our neighborhood has always been Halloween central, mm. but I have no idea what to expect this year. Is it happening in Amherst? <laughs> I, I have no idea what to expect. Oh, I, yeah. I, I was scroogish last year and, and, didn't, and, and didn't turn my light on. Oh no! <laughs> I don't like I, I don't like the like the seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. It's I don't know. I'm like you're too old. <laughs> you don't say thank you. Yeah, we have um we usually have like two to three hundred um kids who come by, and uh, wow. um yeah, it's usually packed. And we have a parade that goes through the neighborhood, and you know, they're not sure they'll do it this year. But then you know, on my wife's seen on Facebook where people are saying, "Can this neighborhood just still do the trick or treating?" And I'm like. I don't know, you know, like, man, if we have that, if we're the only one, we'll have so many, uh, <laughs> many kids. <laughs> it gets a little crazy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one year I bagged it, you know, I had like, um, I made like 175 bags of like a few pieces each. And then that was two years ago, we actually ran out. And then luckily we had other candy, but I'm like, oh, wow, we actually went through, you know, I tried, wanted to keep track of actually how many, how, how many people we actually saw. It was, well, it was over 200. Where do you live? How Where do you live? Pizzas did you get? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I know. And then usually at the end of the night, you do get the high schoolers. So I think it was last year. There were some kids. They're all like, 
they're all dressed in black. They look like they were up to no good, but they were, they were actually nice. And they said, oh, can we have some candy? I'm like, sure. There was like not much left. I said, oh, just take what's left. And then they're really happy. And then like 10 minutes later, the, uh, the police drove by and they're like, have you seen some teenagers? They've been causing trouble in the neighborhood. <laughs> I'm like, thank God I gave them some candy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't. No, no proclamation's been made about Halloween in Amherst. I haven't seen anything. No, there's been safety guidelines. Um, you know, like least safe, like least risk to highest risk, and um, it may. You know, there may be something that you know. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know what whose discretion that is, or maybe maybe Governor Baker will have uh, rules that apply to you know red zone communities like ours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll get back to green by that point. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I know. I'm trying to think what to do. We have a lot of pumpkins to carve, at least. I'll, I'll send pumpkin seeds. I'll give pumpkin seeds out. I'll be the least favorite person this year. <laughs> <laughs> my, dentist, my dentist gives out toothbrushes. She's like, everybody hates it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, someone down the street was giving out little water bottles and apples last year. I was like, oh, all right. Yeah. Um, I've been doing it for 20 years here. And I'm kind of feeling done. <laughs> there aren't any little kids, too many little kids anymore. All right. Are we done? I think so. All right. All right. I'll stop sharing and I'll stop recording. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.